I believe we're ready to go, Mr. Chando. Okay, you, I, I was only viewing uh, six board members, but if you say we're good, we're good. Let me, let me count them one more time. Okay. I have eight. Okay, that's what we should have. Yep. Okay, very good. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to call this meeting to order of, of the Eastern Area School District Board of Education. And at this time, I'd like to ask everyone to please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America. and to, the, and to republic the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'll ask that um, Mr. Ramirez, you have the roll noted. Who is absent, Mr. Chando, please. Okay. Uh, with that, we'll go into the superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Chando. We um, want to take the opportunity this evening to recognize a few individuals. And so as we uh, get that graphic up on the screen, um, and then I will uh, follow with a brief announcement. There they are. Okay. So we're very happy to announce that uh, two of our high school coaches are among the coaches of the year for the 2019-2020 school year. Uh, longtime Easton baseball coach Carm LaDuca and Red Rovers cross country coach Bobby Joe Powell were among the District 11 coaches that have been recognized as 2019-2020 PIAA Pennsylvania Coaches of the Year. The selections were made based on the overall impact a coach has had on his or her program and encompasses not just wins and championships, but also in teaching sportsmanship, stressing the importance of education, leading by example, and doing the right things for their student athletes and schools. So we all know how blessed we are to have both uh, Carm and Bobby Joe, two incredible coaches on our coaching staff, and we'd like to congratulate them and Mr. Kripsak and the entire athletic department. So congratulations, Carm and Bobby Joe. Congratulations. Congratulations. Good job. Oh, I see lots of clapping. That's good. <laughs> okay, next, you know, we've heard a lot um, since returning to school about the job that teachers are doing. And of course it is, it is amazing uh, what they're doing and, and what they're able to accomplish given uh, our current circumstances. What we don't talk about enough, however, are our school nurses. And um, we wanted to give a special shout out tonight to all of our school nurses in the Eastern Area School District. There's certainly no more selfless group of people uh, in our district than our school nurses, um, literally putting themselves in harm's way each and every day in order to keep our students in school. Uh, they're exhausted. Um, and yet they remain professional um, and they're as good as any uh, medical professionals I've ever been associated with. So I wanna say thank you and, and share with them my sincere appreciate, appreciation. And I've asked Dr. Trinkle if she can just give you a little bit of a, a hint as to what they deal with on a daily basis. Dr. Trinkle. Thank you. I do wanna take a moment and recognize all of our nurses listed on, on the screen here. Um, I know you do not necessarily desire a public accolade for the compassionate work that you do daily, but you so proudly, profoundly deserve this small token that tonight's recognition provides you. I cannot express how detailed and comprehensive our team of nurses have been since we, not since we started school, but since we were closed in March. Our nurses have uh, been ultimately responsive and through the most challenging time in public education, they continue to do an exceptional job. They're on the front lines every single day in our schools. Um, and yes, while the Department of Health does provide us guidance and provides us support, all of the efforts to contact trace are unique and dependent upon the information that's provided to us. And that's because of the work our school nurses are doing. They respond so quickly. Um, and the follow-up work is completely dependent upon when they're notified. 
and they do not stop until they have as much information as possible. It's truly difficult to quantify the work beyond traditional hours. And I can, the only thing I can indicate is that they take every single step necessary to provide the Department of Health with a complete comprehensive contact trace line list, um, which is both completed after hours and typically on the weekends. Uh, they have made themselves ex be available beyond exception in order to provide our team with the best possible informed decisions. This does impact normal operations of a health office. However, they still prioritize student care and maintain compliance with immunizations and screenings. Similar to other areas in public education right now, they are becoming more creative in the manner with which to accomplish those items. And I'd be remiss if I did not indicate that while they are exceptional and meeting every single demand right now, they are too feeling the stress, just like every other educator. Um, I have to say um, to all of you here this evening, you are crushing this work. Um, it's tough, it's challenging, and it's exhausting, um, but there is no other group of individuals that I would like to see taking this on and keeping us all healthy and safe. Daily, you care for our children, you care for our families, and that is exponentially compounded by the burden of COVID-19 and how you respond, you roll up your sleeves every single day. You overcome the obstacles every single day. You don't complain all that much, <laughs> <laughs> but you put our students first and you deal with tremendous volumes of paperwork and you go home to your families. And most importantly, you get up every single day again and you do it all over. Um, we are more than privileged. We are blessed for your service. And I wanted to thank you personally on behalf of everyone in Eastern Area School District for the work that you're doing. I couldn't be, we could not be surrounded by more exceptional individuals. So publicly and personally, I thank you. We thank you. Well said, Dr. Trinkle. Thank you for that. Uh, I'll let everybody in on a little secret who's here this evening. Um, the Department of Health over-promised and under-delivered um, when mm -hmm. we came back to school, and I don't blame them. You can imagine the task, uh, and they're certainly underserved, and I'm sorry, understaffed, um, but all of that work that was promised to have been done by the Department of Health has fallen to our school nurses, and as Dr. Trinkle said, they have been exceptional, um, and Karen, I've not heard one complaint, so, <laughs> you know, may, maybe to you, but to me, they don't complain. So we are very proud of them and thankful. And um, just, a, just a little humor. <laughs> understood. understood. Um, and again, I mean, I can't overstate this. We could not have our schools open today if it wasn't for our school nurses. So, um, you know, I'd love to say hug a nurse. You're not allowed to right now, but <laughs> at least at least show them your gratitude when you see them. Yes. And some of them, I believe a, a good portion of them are here tonight. Um, so, for those of you who are here, I thank you. I saw a few of you as I was logging in, but now there's too many to see um, till I scroll through. But I, uh, you know, thank you for making yourselves available this night tonight to hear, you know, a public thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, okay, another round of we applause. Deserved. Well we said. Deserve well it. Thank you, board members, for that. And then finally. Um, Many of you probably had an opportunity to either see or read about the, the statement that was made by the Secretary of Health for the state of Pennsylvania today. Um, obviously, the, it's getting more difficult each day to keep schools open. We certainly understand um, the caution that's been presented to us by the Department of Health. Uh, but for the time being, as indicated as the recent letter that we mailed home, um, we will be staying with the remote model as a district uh, and of course, we will move to, to remote school by school as needed, as either our numbers indicate or um, the county numbers indicate. Uh, we've not yet seen any spread within our schools. That's a good thing. Um, I think educators are doing a wonderful job mitigating. And as I've said number, a number of times, schools are some of the safest places you can be right now. Having said that, um, you know, we are watching those numbers very closely. And if the need comes for us to switch to remote learning K through 12, uh, our buildings are prepared for that. Our teachers and administrators are prepared for that. Um, we'll try to give our parents as much advance notice as possible, but uh, I'm confident that that switch will happen seamlessly. Um, and at this point, I guess we say stay tuned like we do each and every day. And that concludes my report, Mr. Shando, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Preparata, and certainly thank you and Dr. Trinkle for the 
well-deserved recognition um, for the work that our uh, school nurses do. With that, we'll move to number three reports in Colonial Intermediate Unit, Mr. Schneider. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chando. Just uh, real quick, just something that, that came in today. Um, last month at the meeting, we did have a, a comprehensive um, a health and safety update, which, which is too lengthy to, to read here, obviously, but that is available on the IU website for those who are interested. Uh, but we did get an alert today that the uh, the uh, the early learning center, which is in, in Bethlehem on, on London Street, uh, because of a third positive case within a two week period, they are going to be switching to uh, virtual learning um, until after the Thanksgiving break. So that would be for the remainder of the week. Uh, they were not scheduled to have classes Monday and Tuesday to begin with next week. So they plan on resuming uh, December 1st uh, for that. So that was just the most recent thing. For, and that's only affecting the early learning center. That's not affecting the academy. Um, and that's all I have for the IU. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schneider. Uh, Eastern Area Public Library, Mrs. Ramirez, did we get anything that was forwarded? Yes. Okay. So everyone should have received a copy from the library. Um, it was part of our attachments with the board agenda. The next report um, we move to is Career Institute of Technology. And that would be either Mr. Guth uh, or Ms. Price. George, it's Tom. I'll, no, I'll give you a, a brief of the last meeting. Uh, Thank you. CIT is gonna be holding um, virtual open house. Um, I mean, Michelle's on the call. She can tell me if I'm wrong. I believe it's second week of December. I believe you're right. Uh, yeah, one. It, it's all on their website also. Um, and one of the evenings they're going to have um, like all of the instructors and, and, and teachers there uh, where, where for like an hour and a half, I believe, that people can go on and kind of do a live chat and discussion with, you know, specific area instructors um, if their kids are interested. There's also um, some talk with the Tykes, um, the little Tykes daycare center they have that's closed currently because their safety plan on if they keep control of that or have an outside entity take it over, but they still will be able to cross train students in it. Um, a, a bunch of happenings. Um, those are the two biggest things discussed at the part, uh, last meeting. Yeah. The other thing is that due to COVID um, last week, only two districts um, were actually going to CIT because everyone else was remote. So CIT only, um, they follow the districts so what they're doing. Question. Any um, questions for um, either Mr. Guth or Ms. Price on that? Okay. Okay, thank you very much, um, Tom and Michelle, for the report. Uh, Northampton Community College. Um, I don't believe I received anything, Mrs. Ramirez. Okay. Foundation for Eastern Schools, Ms. Sayago. No. Uh, the full report is available for board members in the agenda. I just want to highlight a few things. Um, first of all, the foundation has already um, just four months or so into the fiscal year donated, raised and donated over $50,000 to the school district already. Uh, and that includes the teacher grants, the nine teacher grants, which were recently approved for projects throughout the school district. The foundation also received a grant of $2,000 from Just Born, which is terrific um, to help continue to offset the cost of the K-2 iPads and cases that were purchased for this school year. And then I just wanna highlight a couple of the fundraisers. Um, we spoke uh, last month, I believe it was, about the fundraiser for the um, signs that we support our teacher signs those signs are in so everyone should start to see those popping up in the neighborhoods quite soon and we have two active fundraisers right now um, the first is the lottery board um, 
which was an item that normally would have been um, sold, distributed at the gala. And then we also have a new fundraiser this year, which is um, focused on some artwork created by one of our own Easton teachers that features the high school alma mater that uh, can be printed on a specialized holiday ornament or a t-shirt or a hooded sweatshirt. So if you don't have an order form for those and you're interested, you can um, just get in touch with me and I'll be happy to pass that along to you. And I believe that concludes my report, Mr. Chando. Thank you very much, Ms. Sayago. Uh, next is the Charles Srin Science and Technology Initiative. Um, I don't believe Mrs. Hess was able to join us this evening. Um, so we will forego any report there. We'll move to student report uh, with uh, Dominic Falcone from the Student Council Executive Board President position. Is Dominic available? Uh, yes, thank you. Hope everybody's having a great night. So I just wanted to uh, discuss the things that uh, we went over in the past, I believe we had two meetings since the last time I talked to you guys. So um, with the uh, football game being moved to Saturday, uh, things are going to kind of get kicked into gear here uh, in terms of what we're doing with student council. So the, the Thanksgiving, day, Thanksgiving Day court, uh, that will be announced. Um, and we have this year we selected a king and that is uh, Josh Bredo. So he will be honored at the game. Uh, last meeting, we introduced our freshman class, so they were uh, they joined us in our last meeting. Uh, we did the uh, code of honors for them to be sworn in, and uh, we're very excited to begin working with them too. And just last meeting, I just said to uh, everybody that it's it's important that as uh, student leaders in the school and as role models, it's important that we keep our heads high because uh, like other students will be looking at us in, in the situation that we're in with us getting out of school. It's a heavy weight, but we have to keep our heads high, and uh, we're, we're going to keep stressing that, and we'll, we'll stay on that. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Dominic. Dominic, thank you very much for your report and for uh, your leadership. Much appreciated. Uh, we'll move to Parent Teacher Association, if there was um, a representative. Okay, we'll move to association reports. We'll start with EAEA. Aaron Borgia, I believe, is with yes. us this evening. Hello, everyone. Good evening tonight. Aaron Borgie here on behalf of the Easton Area Education Association. I'd like to give you an update. First, regarding the secondary levels of education, um, it has been reported that the high school staff um, was well prepared to begin teaching students remotely, thanks to the technology training that we've done over the past year. While we continue to work long hours to provide for a seamless transition, it is not easy to pull off. Our teachers are remotely meeting every class every day to ensure our students have continuous and rigorous instruction that prepares them for whatever happens next. The staff has done some amazing work with our students in using new digital tools like News ELA, Flipgrid, ClassKick, Edpuzzle to engage students in a deeper way. Thanks to the board for your willingness to purchase licensing that allows this staff to fully use the technology enhancing our remote educational practice. Our counselors are busy connecting with students who have fallen through the cracks and our nursing staff has never been busier as they continue to operate on the front lines even remotely. Typically, this is the most festive time of the year for our students as we prepare for the Easton Peaberg game and all of our pre-Thanksgiving festivities. So although we are very thankful that the district has made the call to move us to a remote model, understanding that providing for the state safety and well-being of the students and staff is of utmost importance. Our traditions have become one more victim of the pandemic. That's a general summary as reported by the secondary reps. Now we'll fast forward to the elementary story I would like to take a, a step back and rewind to the spring of 2020. The, the elementary story is one of unbelievable execution. 
if you look to the left or you look to the right at surrounding districts, you see that it is so clear that elementary education within the Eastern Area School District proved to be a cut above the rest. When I say a cut above the rest, I mean, I do not know one district that it surrounds us that provided daily, I repeat daily synchronous and asynchronous learning opportunities for our students. That statement of it being unparalleled or an unbelievable execution is supported not only by that key fact, but it is also supported by the principal's thorough presentation last week. That data was very clear in displaying that our efforts paid off when looking at specific same student cohorts. If you remember that data, it did show that um, the students of the same cohort actually pretty much maintained through our masterful delivery during the spring. If we fast forward to the 2020-21 school year, I would like the board and the community and our administration, which I know our administration is well aware that teachers are putting in a tremendous amount of time and effort teaching in a remote and hybrid format, which includes at home and in-person planning and instruction. Teachers have been master masterfully prioritizing curriculum, redesigning traditional instructional and assess assessment delivery methods and resources. Our central focus is our students' academic and social growth. Our greatest challenge at this current time, it, uh, our greatest challenge at this point of time is actually time and management. They are two humongous stressors in the life of an elementary teacher. There are many moving parts at the elementary level that need consideration. We have provided feedback to and participated in several discussions with all levels of administration regarding the challenges we are currently facing and best practices from the viewpoint of the pr practitioner. We do have some trepidations regarding the additional synchronous instruction during the in-person days and how it will impact the overall picture of student learning both in person at home, but we acknowledge the intention was that of a positive intention. At this time, we also would like to extend thanks. The thanks, you know, we have um, next week will be a week and a special time where we all as individuals offer thanks during Thanksgiving time. And uh, we would like to offer our thanks at this point to A, our students. Our stu students are working incredibly hard both in school and at home and accepting the challenges that they've been faced with our families. If anyone's a parent here, you know it's not an easy road for all of this, for all of this transition. Our families are going an extra mile, the extra mile, a million miles to assist their children as they complete independent practice exercises. We'd like to thank the Board of Education and the communities that they serve for truly the purpose of that thanks comes from a place of without you, we would not have the social or from financial commitment to education and, it, and all of this would not be possible. We'd also like to thank administration for their efforts dedicated toward promoting open dialogue. It's a breath of fresh air. Time is one of the greatest gifts one has to give and we are grateful for the time that you have afforded to our membership's perspectives and professional input and we hope that you continue to hear, listen, and, and take all of that into consideration. And finally, from the association's perspective, um, we'd like to thank our teachers for going above and beyond for the many sacrifices that they have made and continue to make beyond the school day. The unseen is often hard to fathom. And you, my teacher friends, are accomplishing great things during this very extremely challenging time in American education. You have shown courage and bravery unmatched and your dedication has also been unmatched. So thank you for the time this evening. And that's the report. Thank, thank you very you. much, Karen.
Um, are there any other association representatives that are um, present this evening and would like to give any report? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to public to be heard on agenda items. If anyone from the public would like to address the board on a particular agenda item, please click the chat icon, follow the instructions to be recognized, and you'll have five minutes. This is for comments on posted agenda items. We have Lindsay French. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to first start by saying thank you to everyone for all of the, the work and the effort that you've put in this year to keep our kids hybrid and in school at least part of the time. I think it's, it's commendable and it's very important. Um, and secondly, um, I wanted to thank the teachers for the work that they're doing. Um, I have two kids, one in um, kindergarten and one in fourth grade at Tracy. And you know, both of their teachers have been doing just a fantastic job this year. Excuse me. Um, so one of the things I wanted to talk about is, is that we're hearing from my kid's teacher that there's going to be more of a focus on Zoom calls, more frequency, more content delivered on virtual days. Um, and I just wanted to say as a working parent that I think that that's not a great idea for all grade levels, um, specifically, for kindergartners who have a short attention span and for working parents who are taking a lot of time out of busy work days to try to um, give the attention that the, the teachers deserve and the attention that the kids deserve when they're trying to get through their schoolwork. Um, my husband and I both have very high demand jobs and it's really difficult at this point as it is, we're already you know, taking two to four hours a day out of our work day to try to help them get through their schoolwork and to get through all of the things that they need to get through to be prompt for their Zoom calls and, and to complete all of their work. And I just, I, I don't think that it's fair to working parents to ask for, I think, additional time and attention throughout the day. Because while I understand the intent is to deliver more education and more content to the kids, Ultimately, it takes a lot of effort on the parents' part to make sure that all of that is happening. And it's just, it, it's, I think what'll ultimately end up happening is you're gonna ask parents to choose between their professional productivity and, and maintaining a job um, and getting their kids' schoolwork done and, and being supportive to the kids. So I think um, maybe for some of the older grade levels that might be appropriate where they can work a little bit more independently. But for the lower grade levels like kindergarten, I, I just don't think it's appropriate. I don't think that it's gonna be productive for a lot of kids and for a lot of working parents because they do need attention. They do need oversight when they're on these calls and when they're doing their work. So, I mean, that's the, you know, the bulk of what I wanted to say. Um, I, I do think that it should be specific grade by grade and not necessarily just a blanket. Everyone needs more Zoom calls, more content on their virtual days. Um, and I, I and kind of in addition to that is somewhat unrelated. Um, the addition of having Zoom calls for the specials throughout the course of the week is also a little bit difficult um, just because it's just another thing on the agenda for the day that we have to make time for and carve out time for. And it would also be helpful to have the specials teachers post all of the work for the week that they're gonna post early in the week. Um, for instance, my children go to school Monday and Tuesday. So the specials, we're getting one assignment Wednesday, one Thursday, one Friday. And again, it's not that we don't wanna get these things done, but it's easier to make a schedule for the week and to carve out time as a parent to have that information all at the beginning of the week so that we can make time and schedule appropriately. My job is unpredictable. I have conference calls that pop up. I have all kinds of things I have to be available for, which just makes it tough to keep adding things on throughout the course of the day. So that's all I had. I thank you very much for your time and for listening. Um, thank you very much. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to um, speak on a posted agenda item this evening? We have Susan Eagle. Hello. Um, how is everyone tonight? 
Good. All right. Good. Yes. Um, I know that we're in stressful times. Everybody's probably a little stressed. Um, but I'm really stressing out over this $400,000 soil removal um, agenda item that you're going to be discussing tonight. And I have some questions that I would really like the school board to it, um, answer regarding this matter. Um, were, no, were no soil borings done prior to the awarding of this contract? I mean, honestly, I, I don't have an answer for you for the, at this time for that. Well, there will be, sorry, Mr. Shando. All right. Shando board members, I was waiting. Um, so we, we will be having uh, Mr. Grice provide a presentation um, or at least be available during the board's discussion of that item. Oh. This evening. And certainly board members can ask that question uh, on this community member's behalf. Okay, and additionally, is there no line item in the contract for soil removal? And if not, why was this not picked up by the school board prior to the contract being awarded? So again, those uh, when that uh, item was presented last week at the uh, com standing committee meetings, I believe every question you asked was addressed at that time. Um, and so when we uh, have that discussion with the board again this evening for that item, we'll make sure that they are answered. And that's going to be discussed tonight. That's correct. Okay. So if I have additional questions that are not addressed when that presentation is is done, can I call you tomorrow, Mr. Preparata, and get, get some answers from you? Absolutely. You can call me. You can email me. Absolutely. Okay. All right. I will wait for that presentation. Thank because you. as far as I'm concerned at this point, it appears that you didn't do your due diligence and shame on you. Thank you for that, really appreciate it. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to uh, address the board on a posted agenda item? We have Katie Lindemann. Hi. Um Thank you for listening. Um, I have two children in the district. I have a senior and I have a seventh grader in the middle school who are both on hybrid. We chose the hybrid model because our children crave human interaction and we we're very con concerned with them not being in, in the classroom. Um, and my, and I, I'm really concerned with the education that they're receiving on their remote days. My seventh grader to date has not had a single Zoom, a single synchronous learning session since school started. I've chatted with the principal multiple times who has gone to the teachers and kind of encouraged them to do some type of Zooming. Um, and still here we are this far into the game and still nothing. And I mean, she basically gets up, does her attendance so that it looks like she's in school and then she goes back to sleep. The, uh, the work that she does can, can be completed in an hour, hour and a half at most. And that's her whole day of learning. And she, this is an honor student. This is a kid in honors pre-algebra. She's learning math on her own. And I keep hearing, oh, we're going to do more. We're going to do more. And I just, re I'm really concerned about both of my children's education and the lack of, of teacher interaction during the day. And I, you know, here I'm trying to motivate my kids to get out of bed and get ready for school and there's nothing. And I just, I guess I look and say, where do we go from here? And how do we, you know, is there not an expectation to these teachers that this is something that they should be doing. And, and I get it, you know, maybe not every single class, but I do know that my child was in the district when he was in middle school and Skyped into his classroom two to three days every single week. And those teachers figured it out quickly. They were able to engage him at home years ago. And we didn't have Zoom and all this technology. We were working on bad internet and so much technology has improved. And yet my kids sit here all day making sure they're putting their attendances in. So it looks like they're being educated throughout the day and they're not. And I guess I just look forward and saying, who do I need to speak to? Where do we need to go from here to address this issue? Okay, so <clears throat> first, let me just say, these are not agenda items. So these are comments that should be uh, reserved for the, the uh, public comment at the end of the meeting. Um, and please feel free also to reach out to me personally 
Uh, I hear your frustration. I'll be happy to work with you on that issue. All right, thank you. I, I've never done this before, so I didn't know when I was supposed to say that. So I do apologize for that. No, we're, no need to apologize, that's fine. But, yeah, that's quite all right. Um, I, I tend not to cut anybody off, even though um, the comments may come um, during the post agenda item. But um, is there anyone else um, that would like to address the board on a posted agenda item? We have Christina Roberts. Hi, um, my, again, my name is Christina Roberts. Um, I have two children. I have a kindergartner and I have a senior in Easton High School. So I've struggled on both ends. Wow. Um, but I do, um, I, my kindergartner, her teacher is phenomenal. And I think has done a phenomenal job in trying to work with each and every one of us and trying to do what's best for her students. And um, as Mrs. French brought out, um, it concerns me that it is a blanket, this is what we need to do, and not something that the teacher and parents can work together with. Um, I understand for some, it might need fixing. And I don't want to say they're not allowed to fix their issue, but I have concerns when fixing their issue um, a great um, impact on providing issues for us. That is something that I'm very concerned with. Um, I too am a working mother. I'm a single mom. Um, it's just me and thank have, you know, for part of it, my older daughter who like was brought out earlier has zero Zoom classes, even though she has the capability of getting on on her own and doing her work and, and getting into those classes, she's got zero expectation. So she does help me, you know, for part of it. And I appreciate that, but that's not her responsibility. Um, I am nervous about the in-school attention that my daughter will now receive. I feel that Monday and Tuesday when my daughter is in school, she gets such wonderful teaching and such a great foundation that allows me on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday to pick up where that teacher left off to be able to continue her learning even though I'm not an instructor. I feel comfortable that her foundation those first two days makes it really seamless. And because I am a working mom and she is only in smaller Zoom classes, because let's face it, she's a kindergartner, I can pick up that work on my lunch break. I can pick up that work and help her through after school. I'm okay with putting in the extra time so that to make this work. But the hard part comes when you dictate to me that my five-year-old who and let me tell you, she's a good kid. She can get on things her own. She's very independent, but she's still five. So now you're dictating that I need to take 45 minutes, another 45 minutes, 30 minutes. What happens when these kids don't want to sit that long? I mean, is she going to be considered no longer participating when I can't get her to sit past the 20 minute mark? She's a five-year-old and that is, that's my biggest concern. Why? does everyone need to change if it's only not working for some? You know, I implore you guys to let the teachers and the parents make these decisions together instead of telling us what you think is gonna be best for our kids because some parents said it was best for theirs. So thank you for listening. I, you know, I appreciate it. And, and I do wanna say again, you know, the parents have been wonderful. The it's been a wonderful support group with the teachers and the other parents in the classroom. I was so nervous having a kindergarten going, a kindergartner going remote. What was that going to look like? And um, I haven't been happier. I mean, these circumstances were the worst circumstances to start school in, and it has been nothing but great. And I'm very, very concerned that that is going to turn a corner come December 1st if these classes become 45 minute long Zoom classes for a, a five-year-old. When my 17 year old who has the capability of sitting, who has the capability of getting on everything herself, doesn't even need to show up. They log in, they do their attendance and they log out. I feel like it's backwards to be honest. So 
but thank you again. I, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there anyone else with the public that would uh, like to be heard on a particular agenda item? If, if so, please, uh, when you identify yourself, also, please identify the agenda item that you wish to speak to. We have Nikki Viscomi. Hello. Um, I think a lot of times we often hear the negatives and I just wanted to take a quick minute to point out a positive. Um, both of my boys are at Tracy. They are in second and fifth grade and they are doing the all remote program. Um, and it is fantastic. Um, it is the perfect balance between work and Zoom and their free time. Um, they're thriving a lot. And I'm very appreciative of all the work that went into putting together the all remote program this year. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other member from the public that would like to address a particular agenda item? We have Mel Ciosiola. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Mel Ciosiola and I live in Easton. Um, I have a kindergartner and a junior in high school. Uh, we're on the all virtual program and I went into it. I was a little reluctant. I was a little concerned, but the program is amazing as far as I'm concerned. I sit in on a lot of my son's, my kindergartner's classes. His teacher is amazing and I don't know how they do it. They're patient. Um, they involve the children in a tremendous way. Um, I've been able to communicate with the teacher um, both by phone and by um, email. Um, and I, I'm, I'm shocked at how enriching the program is. Um, I, I'm pleased and shocked. Um, we, um, as I said, maybe it's our teacher, maybe it's the program, but the whole thing really works. I've put three, I've got some older children. I've put kids through Vassar and Wesleyan and Brandeis and Columbia Business School. Um, and I, I, I'm just, I can't tell you how pleased I am with the program. So um, I know that it may be a concern for some people. We have other children who occasionally go on with my son. But I also find that I think it's important to note that the, the longer it goes on, the more independent my child has become in both operating the programs um, and doing the work on his own. And um, while I check it, um, if he lets me, um, <laughs> he's done really well with it. And, uh, and he likes the independence that he's developing with it. And I'm concerned about the social aspects of, um, of attending school like this, but boy, what a great job under the circumstances that Easton has done. I, I think there are other school districts and I'm familiar with at least one other one. Um, I think compared to the job that others have done, um, Easton has just done an amazing, amazing job. So that's my opinion anyway, and I wanted to voice it since some are concerned. And I don't believe that one size fits all, but the size you have sure fits my kid perfectly. Thank you. Thanks, Mel. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to address the board on a particular agenda item that's been posted? There is not. Thank you very much. With that, we'll move to uh, the next item on the agenda, which is um, section five, executive session report. And it, um, this time, um, we do not have any executive session minutes that need to be uh, publicly identified. So we'll move to section six, which is approval of minutes. And I would like a motion to approve the minutes for the regular board meeting held on September 18th, 2020, and the standing committee meetings held on October 6, 2020 for academics, educational technology, student supports, athletics, budget and finance, and buildings and grounds. So moved, Ed. Second, Brian. It has been moved and seconded. Roll call, Mrs. Ramirez. Barbara Finger. Yes. Mr. Yes. Egan. Yes. Price. Yes. Sayago. Yes. Snyder. Yes. Mr. Whitman. Yes. Mr. Chander. Yes. The motion carries. We'll move to section seven personnel. And I'd like to 
take 7A through 7C as a group. 7A, motion to approve four staff resignations. 7B, motion to approve 11 leaves of absences. And 7C, a motion to approve one administrative transfer, all as recommended. Moved by Meg. Second, Brian. Okay, it has been moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Dr. Gooch. Yes. Dr. Keegan. Yes. Ms. Price. Yes. Ms. Iago. Yes. Mr. Snyder. Yes. Mr. Whitman. Yes. Mrs. Hartraff Fittinger. Yes. Mr. Chando. Yes. Those motions carry. We'll move 7D through 7H. 7D is a motion to elect two professional contracts. 7E is a motion to elect two TPEs. 7F, a motion to elect three long-term substitutes. 7G, motion to elect six support staff appointments. And 7H, a motion to elect two administrative appointments, all as presented. Moved by Meg. Second, Susan. Those have been moved and seconded. A roll call, please. Dr. Keegan. Yes. Ms. Price. Yes. Ms. Iago. Yes. Ms. Snyder. Yes. Mr. Whitman. Yes. Mrs. Hartraff Bittinger. Yes. Mr. Guth. Yes. Mr. Shando. Yes. Those motions carry. Mr. Shando, if I could uh, take a moment to congratulate a few of. Uh, of our newest members of our administrative team. Certainly. Actually, neither of them are new members. Um, one is a longtime high school teacher who has been working now as a middle school assistant principal. And we, get, we uh, were able to approve his begin date tonight. So that's Dean Jones. So again, welcome back Dean, I guess, or welcome to administration from the teaching ranks. Um, really, really excited to have Dean join um, Dr. Simia in the sixth grade center down at the middle schools are doing some great work down there. And of course, um, our very own Tracy Piazza, who's been with the district for many years, uh, and many people uh, know Tracy well and know of her work. Excited to have her join our exec admin team as an assistant superintendent. So congratulations to Tracy as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Piperata. We'll move 7I to 7 L, 7I, motion to elect three volunteer coaches, 7J, motion to elect five extra pay for extra duty stipends, 7K, motion to elect one TPE uh, instructor, I'm sorry, TME, and 7L, is a motion to elect the following support staff substitute that is presented. So move Susan. Second, Michelle. Thank you, it's been moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Price. Yes. Ms. Iago. Yes. Mr. Snyder. Yes. Mr. Whitman. Yes. Hartraff Finnegar. Yes. Mr. Guth. Yes. Dr. Keegan. Yes. Mr. Chando. Yes. Those motions carry. We'll move to section eight, academics, educational technology, and student supports. And we'll move 8A through 8D. 8A is a motion to approve the agreement between the Bethlehem Area Vocational Technical School. 8B is a motion to approve the independent educational evaluation agreement. 8C is a motion to approve PDE 520.1, emergency instructional time template. And 8D is a motion to approve ebook proposals, Mackin and Overdrive, all as presented. 
So move Susan. Move back. Susan. Second, Meg. Okay, those motions have been moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Tiago. Yes. Mr. Snyder. Yes. Mr. Whitman. Yes. Hart Rathbittinger. Yes. Mr. Guth. Yes. Dr. Keegan. Yes. Ms. Price. Yes. Mr. Chanda. Yes, those motions carry. 8E, motion to approve the Colonial Intermediate Unit 20, 2020-2021, special education contract as presented. Moved motion. by Meg. Second, Brian. It's been moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Snyder. Yes. Mr. Whitman. Yes. Mrs. Hartraff Fittinger. Yes. Mr. Guth. Yes. Dr. Keegan. Yes. Ms. Price. Yes. Ms. Sayago. Yes. Mr. Chanda. Yes. The motion carries. We'll move to section nine, budget and finance. We'll move nine A through nine C. 9A, motion to approve the payment of bills for the general fund, special activities, capital projects, and food service. 9B, motion to approve the community development block grant food security award. And 9C, motion to approve the establishment of the new student activity account, shop with a cop for the Eastern Area School District Pol Police, all as presented. Move, Susan. Second, Ed. Okay, they've been moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Mr. Whitman. Yes. Mrs. Hartraff Fittinger. Yes. Mr. Goose. Yes. Dr. Keegan. Yes. Ms. Price. Yes. Ms. Iago. Yes. Mr. Snyder. Yes. Mr. Chando. Yes. Motions carry. We'll move 9D through 9F. 9D, motion to approve the sale of repository properties located at Highlands Boulevard and Nazareth Road. 9E, motion to approve the attached tax assessment appeal stipulations for the properties noted and to authorize the solicitor to execute said stipulations. And 9F, motion to approve <clears throat> the attached stipulation of counsel for the properties noted and to authorize the solicitor to execute said stipulations, all as presented. So move, Susan. Second, Brian. They have been moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Mrs. Hartraff Bittinger? Yes. Mr. Guth? Yes. Dr. Keegan? Yes. Ms. Price? Yes. Ms. Iago? Yes. Mr. Snyder? Yes. Mr. Whitman? Yes. Mr. Chando? Yes. Those motions carry. We'll move to section 10, buildings and grounds. And we'll move 10A through 10D. 10A, motion to approve the five-year proposal to allow Verizon to lease our facilities at the high school fields in Paxanosa Elementary to attach communications equipment. 10B, motion to approve the repairs of the HVAC unit at Shawnee Elementary School. 10C, motion to approve the purchase of T-Mobile hotspots. And 10D, motion to approve change order GC-005 for Cheston Elementary School project in the amount of $12,880.38, all as presented. So move, Susan. Second, Ed. Second, Meg. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. <clears throat> um, roll call, please. Mr. Guth? Yes. Dr. Keegan? Yes. Ms. Price? Yes. Ms. Iago? Yes. Mr. Snyder? Yes. Mr. Whitman? Yes. Mrs. Hartraff Fittinger? Yes. Mr. Chando? Yes. Those motions carry. 10E, 
Motion to approve the soil removal at Cunningham Stadium with the cost not to exceed $400,000 as presented. George, it's Tom. Yes. Can Josh re-give his spiel from last week or a brief summary for the people that have asked, including myself? Uh, yes, Tom, I would, I would certainly think that's appropriate. We'll do that after it's been moved and seconded. Okay. Moved by Meg. Second, Michelle. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Discussion, Mr. Piperato? Thank you, Mr. Shano. I know we have both uh, Mr. Grice and Ken Case on this evening. Um, Josh, as um, was just requested, if you could just give us a little background information in terms of how this came about, <clears throat> um, whether or not we did our due diligence, as was um, stated earlier in the meeting, uh, where the money is coming from, if this is going to cost additional money beyond the project. Um, I think they're the issues really to start with, Josh. Okay, thank you, Mr. Piperato. So um, going back in terms of, of due diligence, um, so yes, there was a geotechnical report that was prepared for the project. That, uh, the intent of that was more for soil bearing capacity in terms of new structures um, and, and overall kind of soil uh, characteristics in terms of more structural related issues. Um, so that process was completed. Um, another process that was necessary for due diligence with respect to soil is with stormwater infiltration. Those are um, items that are required as part of the conservation districts and DEP process with respect to stormwater control. So um, from that perspective, certainly there was a very thorough investigation with respect to the soil on site. Um, the issue really is with respect to um, characteristics and elements within native soils within the region that have become problematic just recently over the past um, eight months or so since 2020, where um, what had previously been acceptable standards in terms of certain elements are now, below, are, are now above a threshold, which is considered clean fill. So really, you know, this, the impact of these new regulations and limitations really did not come forth um, in terms of, of um, I'll say kind of public knowledge or an understanding of the impact that it would have, uh, especially regionally, as I said, because these elements, again, are, are abundant in soils locally and um, you know, there was really no reason based on the history and the use of the site of Cottingham Stadium that there was any indication of uh, con uh, contamination, environmental issues, environmental spills that would require or even raise a flag that there needs to be some type of investigation done in terms of the chemical content or the composition of the soil. So from that perspective, um, that level of detail was not completed by the design team. Certainly um, Mr. Piperato and um, anybody else within the administration certainly would not have the um, ability to foresee that as a need in terms of due diligence. So really, like I'm saying, this, this issue and these limitations are really coming to head as an issue and a cost impact within the past eight months, like I said. So um, certainly moving forward with the Palmer School, it is something that will be on the radar and will be performed. Um, unfortunately, you know, with past projects up to this year, it was really nothing that um, had any cause for concern or raised a flag that needed to be done. In terms of the budget and how it will be handled, like I said last time at the committee meeting, we did include within the overall board adopted budget, a contingency of $500,000. Um, it was not necessarily assigned to this particular uh, issue or this particular change order, 
However, it was there to deal with issues such as these that would come up as unforeseen or unplanned conditions. So in terms of, of money spent, it, it has already been a, adopted or approved by the board in terms of, of an overall budget. Obviously, like I said, we are not happy about bringing this to the board. We're not happy about uh, expending some of this contingency or, or I should say most of this con contingency fund for this matter. It was truly something that was not in the bid that the contractors would not be responsible for and that essentially would be coming out of a contingency type fund. Um, so I think Mr. Piperato that that covered most of it. If there's anything I missed, let me know and I can try to recap. Hey, Mr. Josh, Mr. We'll Grice. open it up to board members at this time. Go ahead, George. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Piperato. Mr. Grice, were these new regulations in place when DEP had to review the project prior to moving forward? Uh, the DEP review is more so related to stormwater. So we go through the conservation district and we get what's called an NPDES permit. And that's again, mostly related to stormwater discharge. DEP ultimately does issue the permit for that. But um, again, nothing was, no flags, no questions were raised with respect to the soil uh, characteristics themselves that would be kind of interrelated with the stormwater report. Um, so, you know, nothing essentially was was raised in terms of identifying this specific concern from DEP. So what what agency then prompted the soil um, reports? The soil reports, um, we we started that effort after hearing issues again locally with other projects that were running into similar conditions, similar elements within the, the soil. Um, ultimately, the contractor would need to, to take this material somewhere. And um, as we were going through that process and determining whether or not they could take it as clean fill somewhere, that's when the characteristic uh, came back that the soil was high in those two elements mostly vanadium um, that would prevent the export from going out as, as clean fill. In other, other words, you know, you can basically just take it to any site. They don't need a special permit or special handling requirements in order to accept the material. May I ask a question? George, are you done? Certainly, yes, thank you. Okay, um, so Josh, um, when you became aware of this issue, how long ago was that? Uh, the tests we did in, I believe, early July. So that was okay. right about the time frame. Okay, Have you got, can you go back to the DEP or whoever said that this fill is no longer uh, clean fill? Can you go back and ask for uh, to be grandfathered in? We have approached DEP a couple different departments several times and the response back each time has been um, they they understand the issue they understand that it's something that is being struggled with not just here but in other places but they feel that if they make an exception for us um, they would have to do so for others as well and the answer has been no both times. Okay. I have a couple of things to talk You're done, Susan? Um, yep, I'm done. Thank you. Yeah, um, George asked when the uh, when these new requirements were put in place. I didn't get any hear an answer. When when did the DEP change this to uh, the soil not clean fill requirements? The regulations kicked in in January 2020. Um, so you know they they were in place. I guess part the the issue really is that um, the the impact with of these new levels really did not come to light until projects started going through the clean fill exercise and realized that the the, the background levels of these elements regionally essentially put put them over the limit 
from the start. So again, it, it's not as if there was a spill or some type of cleanup activity that is kicking the soil into these levels. It's basically just the, the background concentration of these elements within the soil that put it above the clean fill, updated clean fill regulations. Yeah, I mean, at this point, it's probably too late to do anything. It's now like an autopsy, what went wrong and you know, could you have done this and could have done that? So, I mean, what if we were just too late to keep the grass turf without digging in three feet underneath it? But too late, everything's put in motion, bids accepted and so forth? Um, it, yeah, it's, it's um, it would require a pretty extensive redesign effort. Um, you know, certainly I think you wouldn't recoup the full cost of what it would have been from day one in the design. And certainly you would, you would lose the ability to have a multi-use facility. You know, the intent again was to increase, increase use, increase, um, programs within the city and, and even within maybe, uh, local townships that could use the field. And I think you'd really lose that as an option with how the facility can be used for, you know, the long term. Right. I mean, you know, we, this is covered under our contingency, but, you know, what if something goes wrong down the road? You know, yes, this covered with, but now in the future, that's gone. We'll keep that in mind, but, you know, you have to like ask questions, nothing locally, no turf fields put in locally. You said there were some local projects that were caught in this whole thing. Can you explain you know, what local projects face those same things that we face? Yeah, and you know, really, it, it's it's talking with with other consultants, with other engineering firms, um, with other geotechnical firms that have that that are going through the same process. You know, making the appeal to DEP. Um, one of one of the projects actually was successful at the airport, Lehigh Valley International Airport almost an identical situation as ours, but fortunately for them, they have a site that is large enough that they could keep the material on site. So it's kind of kind of odd that, you know, the material, um, as long as it stays on your site, can be reused and it's okay. But if it is to be exported, then it, it is now regulated material. So in dealing with one city block, within the West Ward, it's, it's impossible to move that material and keep it on site. So, um, so that, that's, that's, uh, you know, that, that's a big part of it. That's why we were searching for other options. And as far as other, you know, district properties, um, nothing that could work out with retaining ownership of the soil and moving it to a different site. It, it needed to stay on the same active construction site. Right. Another question I had was, you guys didn't test for contaminants in July when you, you know, when was the first test for contaminants done? For all tests. For, for, for these elements was July, the, the early July timeframe. Okay. My last point is any state officials or our congressperson and representing Pennsylvania and Washington get involved here that could carry some weight to help us through this? Um, I, I guess it's possible. I think a plea really needs to be made to DEP to take another look at, at their limits and understand that regionally, there's not a whole lot that builders can do. We're essentially at or above the levels for a lot of these elements just by putting a shovel in the ground. So um, I guess it's possible, um, but it, I, I don't know that we would get an answer definitively in time for it to be beneficial for the project. So we was lucky we're the guinea pig that got caught, the first one that got caught in his experience of hardship. And now other places can go to school on Easton to kind of make sure it doesn't happen to them. But again, looking back, there's nothing much we can do. So what are you gonna do? I'd just like to follow up on Mr. Whitman's comments. I think your analogy is quite appropriate with the autopsy report. Um, 
but I just have a hard time wrapping my head around if the geotechnical um, report uh, and the soil analysis was done in July from a period of July to January 20th, these geotechnical companies didn't know this was coming. I mean, it, it just doesn't make sense. I, I, you know, it does not make sense that something like this comes down and it was not, there was not any um, time frame given for communication and or um, with the project already started that there, there wasn't a, a, a consideration for a waiver given. It, to me, something just doesn't make sense. Dirt removal is a dirty business, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. So. <laughs> and, and, you know, that this item is on the agenda for approval tonight. I just wonder if there is potentially any merit in the idea of trying to appeal to our um, two local state representatives and senators who, you know, cover the Eastern Area School District and to see if they could make an appeal on our behalf to DEP, you know, given that we are a public entity here and we're talking about a material that is naturally occurring and, and otherwise harmless to try to work with us on, on something um, and maybe look to deal with this again at our, our meeting on December 1st, um, or if we feel that that um, is not a good use of um, our time over the next two weeks. I, I agree with, with that, but I, I think with that's only two weeks from now. I don't know with Thanksgiving next week. I don't know that anything would happen. So I wouldn't see any board action coming again, at least until January. Uh, and then how much, you know, if we table this or, or, if, or if the vote doesn't get approved tonight, how far will it push the project significantly back? Or do we have a little bit of time to play with, with maybe trying to find a happy medium? And the, the other thing I'm concerned to piggyback on that is, is if we end up trying to fight it, it's probably going to cost us more to fight it. And it's just to, you know, deal with the, I guess, with the term autopsy report um, that as is. So just putting out my two cents. <laughs> uh, Josh, when you said city block, is any of this property we're talking about uh, related to the city of Easton or just to the school district? No, oh, it's it's all district property. I, I okay. guess I was just referring to one, okay. you know, one city block of area. Is, okay, gotcha. Is a okay. pretty tight site, you know, even to just maneuver with, and mm -hmm. you know, it, a lot of paving, a lot of concrete, not much grass. So there's really no place mm -hmm. we can take it. Mm -hmm. And what does this do if we if we table this? What, what what's this do to the timeline of the project? I know we're on a tight one as it is. So I don't know if, if you guys have driven past the site recently. I mean, you, you can see that the, the piles are adding up. Um, it's it's going to be very difficult to, to proceed with the precast concrete bleachers if we don't have more room on site to deliver and lay down those very large pieces. So, um, and they are, they are planned to start in the second week of December. So, um, you know, I, I would fear if this if this were to be tabled completely tonight that I think it would have an impact strictly from the perspective with not having much room on site to, to place things. We can at least, if it is approved, maybe start the process, um, pay for whatever tonnage or cubic yards are moved and in the interim, if there's any type of relief or solution that that can be sought, you know, through some political channels, you know, maybe we can avoid the full cost moving forward past that point. But I just I, I fear the process is going to take longer than we anticipate, especially with the holidays coming up. And we're going to get to the point where it's really going to put us, you know, two months behind schedule, which I don't think we we don't have that kind of wiggle room in the project schedule to absorb. Josh, I, you may have explained this before, but just one more time for me is uh, the, the cost is so high for this because we have to send it so far away. Is that, is that what's, you know, the cost of that, the amount of money? No, actually the, well, 
par partially, but the material is, is deemed regulated and it needs to be disposed of and handled by a facility that's approved to accept the regulated material. That comes with, with a, a premium, a fee. Um, the initial cost and one of the only places when this first came up, one of the one of the only receiving sites that we were aware of, you know, through many channels, was located down in Harleysville, which would have been, you know, almost a three-hour round trip to get down there and back. And we were able to find a site in Bethlehem, just off the 412 uh, Hellertown exit on 78 which is much, much closer. And that was, we were able to get the cost down from there. So it, it's more so just the regulations and the requirements that are needed even by the receiving sites that need to handle the material. Obviously it costs more to take it there than it would be to just dispose of it as clean fill at any construction site that might need good soil material. So both of those places, they're charging us a fee and we're, we're choosing the one that's closer because that will cut down on the transportation costs. That's correct. We're, we're moving this out 12 cubic yards at a time. Yep, triaxle loads are going to be moving the material. So the trucking is killing us just as much as the uh, disposal. But yeah, you know, I'm finished with my questioning. I'm just gonna say that I'm kind of disappointed that if these regulations changed in January of 2020, that nobody picked up on anything that, hey, this might affect this or that, or, you know, all the experts, just disappointing. No, Josh, just one more question. I hope it doesn't sound silly. Um, I would just wanna clarify this 400,000 is on top of what would have been put into the bid as far as the normal disposal of uh, clean soil. Is that correct? That, that's correct. We did get okay. a credit offset of what the original hauling destination was assumed to be, again, had it been clean fill. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Are you going to be using the same uh, services for the removal of the dirt? Uh, you know, clean versus the, the not clean uh, fill? Or do you have yes. to bid that yes. out to somebody else? Yes, the general contractor will be using okay. uh, the same trucking forces. Okay. Yep. So okay. I guess ultimately, though, if we had known about, the, or you had known about this, that, you know, this cost would have been... Um, let's say assumed by the contractor, but ultimately would have resulted in a higher bid regardless because somebody's got to pay for this material mm -hmm. to be disposed of. True. That, that, that's right. And um, yeah, that, that's correct. So that would have been included on bid day as a cost in the bid. And, you know, I know it doesn't, it doesn't make it better. I, I understand that, but I think, as I said at the committee meeting last week, again, locations are, are finally getting caught up with going through the permitting process to accept this type of material. And there are actually more options moving forward as places adopt, you know, and, and adjust to these requirements. So again, the, the first place, the only place that was an option months ago was, was down in Harleysville. And you know, we're talking about a not to exceed 4,000 number, which would have been almost double if, if we had, if we had that as the destination. So back in the bidding time frame, I don't know what the bidders would have even done to try to put in a decent number to get rid of this material, because um, the options would have been very, very limited. Any other questions by board members? Uh, just one, if I may, and, and you probably mentioned this at the committee meeting, I apologize. When when the sampling was done, uh, I, I don't know how all this works, but was it done at, a, at a, just a, a specific part of the lot or was it is it done at random spots? Or if the sampling, if you find just one sample in anywhere in the lot, does that make the whole, the whole load uh, 
I keep forgetting the term, uh, regulated, I think is the term you keep using. Does, does that question make sense? It does. It, okay. The number, the number of soil samples is um, related to how much material needs to be exported. So in this case, it's, it's approximately 15,000 cubic yards. Um, so there were, um, I believe it was over 90 um, test locations, discrete test locations. Those are then combined into composite samples. So, you know, there might be two or three discrete locations that are, are put together into a composite sample. And those samples are what is analyzed for the components. So um, it was a sampling process throughout the entire area of the playing field, not just one or two um, remote locations or, you know, okay, it, it was so, throughout, throughout the entire area. So it's not just one bad one spoils the bunch. You said there were 90 or so done. Okay. Okay. Right. That's, I think that's, fair and thorough, at least from that perspective. So thank you. Any other questions uh, on this agenda item? Yeah, I'm sorry, I did say no more, but I have one more. What about the Kunkel track? Can't find a place out there for, it's our property, right? You said if it goes on our property, it can be disposed. So what, what you also need is an, an NPDES permit for the site that will receive the material. So in this case, the Kunkel track, nothing's happening out at, at the high school that would have an NPDES permit attached to it. So that would be one thing. And then the other thing that you need to do is sample the soil at the receiving site and just make sure that it is um, no, no better than the soil that you're going to bring to it. So there's a whole sampling process that needs to happen to compare point A to point B. And if point B falls within, you know, certain parameters related to point A, then it's a possibility. But again, you also need a conservation district permit in order to do that. How long would something like that take? Conservation district permits, an NPDES permit, which is required for anything over one acre, is usually a four to six month process. They're yeah, rocking hard. Yep. And certainly through nobody's fault within you know, the board or the, the administration. Okay, I'll ask one more time if there's any other questions or clarifications that are needed. Okay, seeing none, we have a motion or we have an agenda in that's been moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Dr. Keegan? Yes. Ms. Price? Yes. Ms. Iago? Yes. Mr. Snyder? No. Mr. Whitman? I'm going to say no, just and table it for the next meeting coming up, just because uh, I know Josh said if we have too much dirt, we can't. We can put the piles back in the field to put the bleachers in give us another month to kind of see what else we can do here. So I'm going to say no table till next month. Ms. Hartraff Bittinger? No. Mr. Goof? Yes. Mr. Chando? Yes. What's the, what's the tally, Ms. Ramirez? Five to three. Okay, thank you. Sorry, five to four. No, five to three. I'm We're sorry, five to three. I apologize. We have eight board members. Yes. Motion carries. Uh, we have no other business listed under number 11. So we'll move to section 12, public to be heard on non-agenda items. If there's anyone in the public that would like to address the board on a particular, on a non-agenda topic, please click the chat icon, follow the instructions to be recognized and you'll have five minutes. Are we seeing anybody? We do not have anyone. Okay, thank you very much. With that, we'll move to any other business from board members. 
Yeah, go Rovers this coming Saturday. Okay. Yeah, it certainly is um, a Sorry, unique Coach. situation. I mean, I don't know how else to describe it. We all know from March of 2020 to present, whatever can go wrong has gone wrong. And whatever can um, uh, you think you're going in one direction, you're heading in an opposite direction. And why shouldn't it be any different than Thanksgiving Day football between Easton and Phillipsburg to be impacted the way it is? Um, you know, uh, you know, my my um, accomplishments and in, in, in praise to both administrations for having to deal with this problem. Uh, I feel sorry for the um, the uh, students who are missing out on all these wonderful um, activities and traditions that take place, um, you know, in, in, in the districts. Um, for, for, you know, I, I know if you were involved in the Eastern Area School District as an as a employee or in the first school district, you certainly know all those activities and how well it, um, it um, brings the student bodies together um, and, and the school together. So unfortunately, you know, this is something else, chalk it up to 2020 that uh, the children are, are, are going to mi be missing, but um, we will have a football game, <laughs> you know, thankfully. And uh, once again, I, I can't thank the administrations of both school districts enough for at least uh, being able to come up with some type of activity like that. I did read there's going to be a parade. I don't know about the parade route, but, um, you know, get out there and support the Rovers. Okay, any other board members with any other business or comments? I just yes. have a question. What time would be the parade? Um, do we know the time, the, like the hours that's going to happen? And I, fortunately, I know nothing about the parade. I just hearing it from Susan is the first I've heard of it. Uh, but I, I, I read it on Facebook. Okay. I think it was um, from Rover Nation. Yes, it is. Uh, Rover <laughs> Nation, maybe, or or the um, athletic department. Well, it was one of those, or, or the boosters, I think it was. Uh, but it, I read it and it seemed very legitimate, so. If I get any information, I'll be happy to forward it to the board. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, it, oh, yeah, Mr. Chando, yes, thank you. And I, I just wanna, I, I, if there are some seniors out there listening, uh, I, I just wanna say, I, I hope they can, um, Hope they keep this in mind that that if that if things do show improvement and we're able to start gathering in larger groups again uh, towards the end of the school year, uh, I'm hoping the senior class uh, is be able to do something, maybe to, to plan a bonfire at that time, maybe in conjunction with another event instead of a football game, perhaps even a, a community event, maybe even paired with their rivals across the river. Um, so I would like to just put that out there that if we are able to do that as per Department of Health and, and Department of Education guidelines, maybe maybe in April or May, that uh, the board that the senior class will have have my support as a board director. Thank you. I second that, Brian. I think that's a great idea, Brian. Yep. Thank you. Thank Fingers you. crossed on that. <laughs> Any? Thank you, Mr. Snyder. Any other comments? I'd just like to wish uh, Tracy uh, the best. I know she'll do very well at her new position and, um, you know, looking forward to working with her. I'm sure we all are. Thank you, Susan. I think you echo everyone's comments. comments. And thank you. <laughs> yep. Uh, with that, if I'm hearing no other business, um, just before I adjourn, certainly on behalf of the board, and I'm sure Mr. Pipperai and his administration, uh, as the upcoming Thanksgiving Day holiday, we certainly want to wish the best for everybody. Um, Thanksgiving will be different for everybody, but it is something um, that we do every year in November. We give thanks for everything that, um, that we have. And um, certainly on, on behalf of everyone, uh, the best to our, our families and um, our employees uh, for a, a very um, uh, happy Thanksgiving uh, and one that um, 
Hopefully everyone can stay safe and stay healthy. With that, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved, Ed. Second, Susan. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Roll call. Mrs. Ramirez? Right. Ms. Price? Yes. Ms. Iago? Yes. Mr. Snyder? Yes. Mr. Whitman? Yes. Mrs. Hartraff Fittinger? Yes. Mr. Guth? Yes. Dr. Keegan? Yes. Mr. Chando? Yes. The motion carries. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for- Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.